Hey everybody, welcome back. And I'm, I'm delighted to welcome longtime friend, longtime collaborator, Wimbush, back um, to present for us. And Wimbush is an amazing uh, educator and especially well known for connecting the dots on technologies. So connecting things like cinema and Unreal and recommending workflows. So uh, he's going to share some things to, in fact, I think they're up on the screen now about where you can find out more about this but you can find out more about this right now because he's, he's this is first of two presentations where he's going to take us on a journey as I understand um, back with back. yes yeah. a magic <laughs> a magical journey including cinema and unreal and how to connect those technologies 100%. so take it away Wimbush I appreciate it thank you Simon so all right what up what up Wimbush here and today I'm excited to be here in Van City, in front of you guys, with um, courtesy of Maxon. If you want to follow me on social media, you see it up there on the screen. YouTube.com is where you can normally find me. And um, I'm going to jump right into the presentation. So let's get right into it. And so, <coughs> excuse my voice there. This is the scene that we're going to be building out here. And so right now, I'm inside of Unreal Engine. And I wanted to build like a fantasy type scene, something that you would see probably in like The Legend of Zelda or Borderlands 3. And so my workflow is I start inside Cinema 4D, bring everything into Unreal Engine 5, as you can see right here. And this is the final result. So we have like some tune shading going on. Actually, let me start up my camera here. So let me open up my camera. And I'm just gonna play through this for you guys real quick so you can see what the end result's gonna be. So we're just gonna be kind of walking over the bridge, looking at the well pulling up into the end scene where we see Zelda sword actually Link's sword inside the power stone there and that's going to be the end result so I'm going to show you guys how we could build this fantasy side world starting inside of cinema 4d and moving into unreal engine 5 but before we get into the workflow I actually want to announce that I'm running a contest with EJ aka iDesign we're doing a, um, like a tutorial series getting cinema 4d artists kind of more familiar with um, working with Unreal Engine 5. And so I'm going to play a trailer and then I'm going to tell you guys about some of the prizes you can win. And so let me get that taken away. We're going to have... I've teamed up with Unreal Engine guru, Jonathan Winbush. What up, what up? Winbush here. To create this tutorial that's actually a little bit more like a visual podcast. So in this video, Winbush is going to be walking me through how to create this forest scene inside of Unreal Engine. And along the way, we're going to be seeing how Unreal works in relation to Cinema 4D. Seeing what features are similar, just to help us make those connections in our brain to try to understand how Unreal works and all the features and settings that may be pretty similar to what we have inside of Cinema 4D. We'll also be discussing how Unreal Engine is being used in motion design right now and how we think it's going to be a massive player in the motion design field in the years to come. We even talk about a contest that we have going on that is going to incentivize you to learn Unreal Engine with some pretty awesome prizes. So if you want to learn about that, check out the links in the description. Now if you just want to check out how to build up the forest scene without the back and forth banter between myself and Wimbush, you can check out that step-by-step -step tutorial over on Wimbush's YouTube channel. But this video is very much a conversation between myself and Wimbush on Unreal and me trying to make observations and trying to lean on my knowledge of how Cinema 4D works and trying to apply those similar concepts and seeing how those translate to how Unreal Engine works. And we had a lot of fun recording this and I hope you have just as much fun watching it. So that's currently what we're working on right now. And so EJ's coming from the Cinema 4D side I'm coming from the Unreal Engine side and we're kind of just talking back and forth over the course of a few hours and he's kind of letting Cinema 4D artists kind of see where the similarities are in there and everything. And so some of the prizes that you could win at 3090 um, courtesy of Puget Systems, we're going to have um, a complete year of Maxon 1 as you can see everybody's been displaying here. So Redshift, ZBrush, Cinema 4D, Forger, Auto Red Giant Sweep, so you're going to get that. Along with, um, we're going to have a loom pad to give away. So that's a holographic display. Go to my YouTube channel to check some of that stuff out. And then we have Epic Games, which just jumped on board as an official sponsor. So I have $1,000 worth of credits to give away for the marketplace. And also Pixel Labs is giving us some of their kits. So they have a bunch of like Redshift kits and Octane kits, materials, kit passion stuff. 
that we're going to give away with the contest as well. So make sure you guys enter because it ends on September 1st. But enough of me rambling. Let's get into making this scene here. So as you guys can see, I'm actually inside of Cinema 4D version 26, the latest and greatest. And I'm going to get started off by creating the terrain right here inside of Cinema. And so let me go. I'm going to adjust my screen here a little bit. And I'm going to come up to where we have this cube right here. So if you're new to Cinema 4D or you're not familiar, if you come up to your cube, this is going to bring up all the different geometries in which I'm going to use this landscape here too. I really love using this landscape just to kind of give myself a basic terrain. And I usually bring this in from Cinema 4D into Unreal for like my terrain building and stuff. So I have some of these attributes kind of memorized. So I'm just basically building out like my hero hill there. And so I'm doing it like 1500 by 300 by 1500. You can see that we're starting to build up our little hillside here. I want to add a little bit more polygons to this because when we bring it into Unreal Engine, the more polygons we have, the better whenever we're going to do some vertex painting, which I'll show you here in a bit. But let me start adding some more segments to this. So I'm going to crank this all the way up for like the width and the depth segments up to 400 by 400. My rough heroes, I think. Let's say we want to get maybe somewhere, I think 35 will be suffice for my fine furos. Probably just zero out just to kind of smooth everything out in there a little bit. And I know I was working on this earlier, so I know I want to do like a C of four because I really like this, this different formation that we have here. So you can see we have some really nice curvatures going up to the hill. And this like, this plays really nicely for the steps that we want to have come up to the top. And so the next step that I'm going to take from here I'm actually going to add a camera to my scene and this camera is not going to be functional. The reason I like adding a camera is just so I know exactly where the center point is inside of my world. So you'll see here if I come over to my coordinates and I actually zero everything out. This is where my camera is at zero axis and then I just take it on a Z and pull it back. And I know now this is exactly where my orientation should be. So that's something that I typically do when I'm working just because whenever I just randomly start throwing stuff around the scenes, sometimes it could get discombobulated when you're working. So I love working in axis of zeros and kind of building everything out from there. If that makes any type of sense, maybe I'm just a weirdo in that regard, but <laughs> you know, it works for me. So it's all good. And so I know that I want my camera to be facing this way, which would be north. And so from here, I'm actually going to create a spline that's going to go along the curvature of this landscape here. And so in order to do that, I'm actually going to come into my top viewport here and I'm going to pull back a little bit and then I'm going to change it for my shading. I'm not even sure how to say that. Is that like garage shading, something like that? I don't know, just garage shading. That's what we're going to call it. So I'm going to do that so I can see the curvatures and everything inside of my landscape. And then I'm going to come up here right to or right next to where my geometry is and we have the spline pin. So I'm going to click on this and I'm just going to do a basic spline pin. And then I'm going to come down here maybe to like the edge of my geometry. I'm going to do a click and then I'm just going to left click and drag. And we're not seeing it because it's actually putting it underneath the geometry. But I'm going to do like a projection trick that's actually going to align our spline onto our geometry and make it line up perfectly. So I'm probably just going to do like one more point here. Just click and drag out like so. And then I'm going to hit escape on my keyboard. And then I'm going to go back to my perspective view. If I actually hide my landscape, now you can see that I have my spline here. And this is how I'm going to have my steps aligned across my terrain here. And so what I'm going to do is actually get out of point mode. Just go here into object mode. And I'm just going to drag my, um, my spline up north a little bit, like so. And then I'm going to turn back on my landscape here. And now we can see I have my spline hovering above my terrain. And so I could get this to precisely go along the curvature of my terrain by doing a projection. It is super easy. Basically, I'm just going to go back into my top viewport here. And if I go back and forth, just say, hey, stop going back and forth. I love going between the different viewports to kind of get the perspective that I need for that moment. But I'm in my top viewport. I'm going to go into point mode. Then I'm going to select all my points here. And then I'm just going to right click. And right here under move, you can see we have like this little camera looking icon. And it says project. So I'm actually going to click on this. And for my options, for my mode, I want to do view. Now this is why I'm doing like the top viewport is because when I hit projection, 
it's going to take it from wherever I have my viewport looking at and it's going to actually push the spline down into my geometry which I'll do here in a moment so you guys can see it so I'm just going to hit apply and now you can see well you probably couldn't see it in the top viewport but let me go back to perspective and now if I'm in my perspective you can see that my spline is perfectly aligned across my geometry there and so this is cool because I could bring in different objects and put it into like a MoGraph cloner and then I can have those objects actually go along the contours of my landscape here which I'm going to actually do right now and so for this demonstration instead of building everything from scratch I actually created like this Wimbush kit bass with like all these different fantasy items and stuff in here so a real basic kit bash I like doing this whenever I'm creating because it's kind of like playing with Legos at this point like I could just pull from my kit bash that I made start dropping them to my um, my scene and everything there and then if I later want to start creating like custom items at least I know and have a point of reference of stuff that I want to create or kind of like um, move out from there and so I'm going to start off with these steps that I have over here and these were all done in like this cartoony style here which is kind of what I was going for so I'm going to select these four different stones here and all I did was hold down shift and just click each one individually then I'm going to come up here to edit and then I'm just going to come back over to my scene and hit edit and paste so I'm going to click on yes for this just to bring my textures over go back to object mode and then like I said I like zero everything out so everything is in direct center I'm going to hide my landscape again and I'm going to start working with my cloner tool inside of um, Cinema 4D here. So I'm actually going to hold down the Alt key and left click on my stone three and four because I want to work with these large ones first to kind of get the curvature of my landscape and everything. And then I'm going to show you a trick on bringing in the little ones that kind of added like randomization and kind of vary it up. And so from here, I'm actually going to go up to MoGraph, come down here to Cloner, and then I'm just going to select both of these steps here that I brought into my scene bring them into my cloner and you can see that we have them as a grid array in which I want to actually use the spline as the object to move it along my contours there in my landscape and so in order to do that I'm going to click on cloner and then I'm going to come down here into object come down to mode and then I'm going to come down here where it says object inside of mode so right there you see we have like a little panel here this is object and we can actually just left click and drag our spline into there and now we have all of our different stepping stones and they're going perfectly aligned to the contour of our landscape there in which they're extremely large so I'm probably going to go back into my cloner come down here to transform for my scale maybe do like 0.5 something like that and then come over here start working with these rotation attributes like so so probably like 180 for that and then I think let's do like 90 for the top one and then zero for that one there and now you can see that our steps are kind of going funkily <laughs> I guess that's the word funkily along the spline here and it's like once we get up to the top here everything is congested and that's because I only did my spline with three simple points but if I go inside my cloner I can actually tell my steps to align perfectly along the spline like so so if I come down here to my object and then right here where we see distribution you can see like I have 10 steps right here and like I said, it's kind of going along the vertices of my spline in which I don't want. I'm going to click on count right here and I'm going to click on even. And now my steps are evenly distributed going up my, uh, my landscape here. And then even from here, it's like I don't want my steps going all the way up there because this is where I want to have like my little hero section right here where I have like the sword and the stone and everything. And so I'm going to come back down here to cloner and maybe come down here to start and just start dragging these up. A little bit like that and then on end I'm going to drag these down here so so I'm not sure if you guys can see that let me actually pull this up and so I'm using this start and the end right here and so all I'm doing is basically it's like a train it's just like moving it along the railroad right there until like I get into a good spot that I find suffice for my scene here maybe I can move this closer to the edge like so so something along those lines are going to fit perfectly well and if I want to like change this up later, like inside of Cinema 4D or Unreal, I'm able to do so. And so I don't want to miss too much time up here. I'm actually going to bring in, actually I already have them in here. So let me hide this landscape and I'm going to start working with the smaller stones. And I'm going to add them along the path as well, but I'm going to have them replace some of these bigger stones here just to add a little bit of variety. 
And so what I'm gonna do first is actually make sure these are zeroed out. So these are zeroed out and then I'm gonna come over here to object and I'm gonna group them into their own object. Now you'll see why I wanna do this here in a second because I'm gonna take this null, actually let me name this one first, stepping stone. And I'll name it stepping stone one because I'll probably do a second one here as well. So I'm going to click and drag this into my cloner. And you can see that it started to replace some of the bigger stones that we have in there. But it looks like we only have one stone. Now the reason that I like putting it inside of a group object is because if I click on the individual stone here inside of the null, inside of the cloner, I can actually start individually moving the attribute of that individual stone. So if I didn't put this, side in, this inside the null, it wouldn't work like this. Like you can see, I'm actually moving the stone like this, like so. Then I'm gonna do it for the other one as well. And I'm able to manipulate the transformation of each individual object as long as it's inside the node there. And maybe we just add like a little rotation on each of these stones, just to vary up a little bit, like so. So this is a cool way to just kinda customize it, like make it random, but still customize that randomization without using the randomizer in there. And if I wanted to, I could hold down the control key, left click, and drag, and that's just gonna make a copy of it. And then I can name this one Stepping Stones 2. And I'm just gonna actually switch these around. So maybe I have this one on this side instead. I have this one go up here instead. And so now we're just adding a little bit of variety. Like you can keep going, but you guys kind of get the point of what I'm trying to do here. So. If you look back at my scene now, we have a combination of like these little stones and then big stones and little ones. It's kind of doing it in a pattern right now. Like if you wanted to randomize it, I could go back to my cloner and come down here to clones where it says iterate. And if I just click random, it's going to totally randomize everything that's in there. And of course we have a seed here as well. So I could just kind of randomize it until I see something I like. Maybe I like something along those lines right there. And of course, I wanna hit Control S. I'm gonna save this just so I don't lose anything. So I'm gonna actually name this one SIGGRAPH22 build underscore version two. So I don't save over my one I was working on before. So I'm gonna click on save on there. And then um, let's see what I wanna go from here. So I think I'm gonna go back to like the Wimbush kit bash and maybe we'll add in, let's say that bridge. That's gonna be an easy one to add in. So really love this bridge right here. We have like a fishing pole and a bucket. So I'm gonna click on bridge, click copy, come back over here. And from here, it's pretty much just gonna be like playing with Legos. I'm just gonna be bringing some stuff in from my custom made kit bash kit there and just start dragging and dropping it into here until I find something that I like. And then we're gonna bring it into Unreal here in a little bit. So just kind of building out my scene here. Let's say I wanna have this bridge, probably not that close to the edge let me see move this down a little bit so let's move this up like so and I'm just trying to align it on my steps again I can always go back in and manipulate this as I see fit but something like that will look pretty dope so I'm at my bridge you can see the stone path going up here and that stone path is going to lead into our little stone hero area which I'm going to just bring in right now so I'm going to go back to my kit bash come over here and I have this little hero stone that I want to have the sword hanging out of. If I click on it, you can see, actually, I think I jacked that up. Okay, so this is, this is good because you can see right here, the axis is off. I like having my axis at the center of my object so I could go in and manipulate it. So if you ever bring in like an object and you see like your little pivot point is off right there and you want to center it to your object, it's as easy as going up to tools and then coming down here to axis and where it says axis center right here you just going to click on this and this is just going to bring up another window with this other attribute window and what you want to make sure i usually just click everything on so i have like point center here include children uh, objects and this is if you have it in a null but this is just an object of course and then it looked like it already did it because i had auto update but if you didn't have that selected you hit execute and you can see that my pivot point went into the exact center of my object there and so from here, I can actually go and move my pivot point to the bottom of my selection, but it's still gonna be inside the center of my object here. So I'm gonna go into like a front view over here like this. 
then I'm just going to click and drag my pivot down so it's still inside the center of my object but I can have it at the base of it as well so again if you miss that it's over here on the left hand side where it says enable axis that's how you're able to move your pivot point and everything and then as soon as I select that off now it's in the, um, the point that I put it at so I'm going to go back to my perspective window here pull back a little bit and I'm just going to copy and paste this one into my scene as well so click yes and then I'm just going to zero out and have it at the center point of my scene here and then maybe I can move it a little bit forward so it's a little bit more aligned with our steps here and everything and so I like the sizing of it so I'm not going to change anything else there but I do want to maybe add a couple of stones that's going to surround this area here so again I'm going to use the cloner again to do that but I'm not going to do it with a spline I'm just going to do it with a radial so I'm going to start off with maybe these type of stones here because they're in the same type of vein of like my big magic rock here so I'm just going to gather a few of these stones copy them and then I'm going to put them inside of a cloner and just kind of have it surround my little stone here my magic stone I'm going to have my what's the link sword called it's not the trident right so I forget what it's called but we're going to have it in there and then I'm going to put this inside of a cloner and you can't see it because it's below my geometry but I'm going to actually pull it up after I put it inside my cloner so I'm going to name this one cloner magic stone magic stones maybe because it's plural there's more than one and then I'm going to come down here to with my objects and where it says mode I'm going to come over here to radial then I'm going to drag this up into my scene and now you can see we have more than two rocks we have the same two rocks but we have a bunch of them and we can actually make these two rocks look like they're a bunch of different rocks by adding like a randomizer and stuff in there so I'm just going to put this maybe let's add a couple more so maybe like a count of seven and then I could change the radius out just a tad bit and maybe for my start angle let's move this somewhere around like this so I'm just going to have it surrounded but I didn't really want to cover it so if you're looking right here under angle you can actually change the angle of my radial curve here and just like change the different um, degrees here and move this around and then I think I just want to randomize it a little bit with like the rotation and the scale and everything so again I'm going to come up here to MoGraph make sure I have this cloner selected I'm going to come up here to MoGraph come down here to editor and then I'm just going to randomize it and you can see that it jumped around and that's because if I come to parameters it actually comes with the position already turned on so I'm just going to zero this out so I'm not really too concerned about position I more want to change just the rotation so I'm just going to change these heavy like that just to add a little bit more randomization in there then I'm going to change the scale I'm going to click on uniform scale and absolute scale and then just maybe shrink these down a tad bit something like that and then I do have this other stone in here that has like a little bit of like moss at the bottom it has like a different tone than these rocks but if like you go hiking like I do you know we have like a variety of hikes out there when we're out there in the wilderness so I'm just going to add this one in here just for some variety so I'm actually going to hold down the control key left click on magic stones make a copy of it like so and then I'm just going to name this one cloner stone I'm just going to put the one in here but they're not magic stones they're just regular stones so I'm going to click paste and bring this one in and I'm going to zero this one out so I can just drag it into my cloner make sure I delete these ones first And then I'm going to bring my let's see there we go so now I have a little bit more variety in here maybe we just add I can start twisting these around like that and I'm cool with it kind of moving into each other because I'm going to add like foliage and other type of shrubbery and stuff around here so I just wanted to get like the basic setup for my rocks in here maybe I could like manually put like one of these bigger rocks or two into my scene so I'm going to paste this one in here as well and let me drag this up so I like it maybe behind it then if I hold down control left click drag just make a duplicate of it as well 
maybe we bring this one over here and make it maybe a little bit smaller like 0.6 something like that so i mean this is what kit bashing is all about right it's just like playing with little legos putting your pieces together and seeing what you come up with so anytime you're on like some type of like creative rut or something like that i usually like to mess with like kit bash pieces just throw some stuff in there see what comes about and then just kind of take it from there it's a good way of getting out of your creative rut if you're trying to think of ideas and stuff like that. Like I love going to like art station or um, Sketchfab and just grabbing different objects from those different sites, throwing them into a scene and seeing what I could come up with and kind of taking it from there. So I'm trying to think, is there anything else I want to add into my scene? Yeah, let's add like a gate. So I promise it's going to get a lot more funner after this too. I'm just kind of setting the scene up here. So I'm going to quickly just start throwing these objects into here so i'm gonna have like this little like ruin gate and i love how it's kind of going through the geometry and everything as well so maybe let's have it like that because it's like as our hero comes up the steps there's like this little hieroglyphic like ruin gate that's going to be surrounding it and everything and maybe let's do a duplicate for the other side so i'm going to bring it on the other side just to properly enclose it so as you're coming up to the top of the mountain here you're going to be greeted by this little hieroglyphic ruin gate in which since it's like ruins maybe we just add a little bit of tilt you know add a little bit of gangster lean in there because it's been up there for a little bit so it's not going to be perfectly up and down it's not going to be perpendicular so maybe we add a little bit of shoulder lean to this one as well let me come up here there we go something like that and then i do have like this big giga sword back here that i want to add behind it kind of just like a pillar to let people know like hey this is going to be the area if you're in, like playing a game or something you usually have like these landmarks to show people like hey this is where the item that you want to get is going to be at so this is going to signify that this is where our sword is at inside of our little make-believe game level here so let me move this back here again just going to maybe put it like on a little tilt something like that and that should be cool right there and then i have this little well because i'm actually going to show you guys how we could bring interactive water into our scene and unreal if you caught it from the beginning i actually had like an interactive lake that was moving around in there so of course it makes sense to have maybe like a well on our little island here so i'm just going to paste this one in here as well so let's go bring this and just maybe have this at like the foot of our bridge here something like that and then maybe we'll have some pillars that will greet you once you come across the bridge so this will be the last item that i bring in actually now i'm going to bring in my sword here as well so again just going to copy and paste these into the scene we're almost done setting it up and then we're going to bring it into unreal engine here in a bit so I can actually probably even scale this down a little bit with my transform tools something like that and then i'm going to make a duplicate of this one and bring it onto my other side here so just as we're coming across the bridge we're going to be greeted by these pillars we're going to have this well over here and then we're going to climb these steps all the way up until we come to our hero stone right here in which I'm going to add the sword right now and that's going to be the last piece for this little kit bashing session that I came up with here so say so yes one more time and I'm going to have the sword just sticking out of the stone here like so so let's bring this over I'm going to rotate this one let's see so I'm going to bring it down by 90 degrees something like that and then maybe we'll just rotate it so it's facing forward a little bit don't want to have it going perpendicular because we want to give the hero maybe a little bit of trouble as he's trying to pull it out of the magic stone there so there we go i think that's going to be the basic setup for our scene here maybe i can add a material to my landscape there just to signify that it's going to be grass but i'm not going to do texturing inside of cinema for that i'm going to do that part inside of unreal but what i like to do sometimes is just make like a basic color setup so i know like whenever especially if i have more complex scenes i know like this is going to signify grass so when i bring it into unreal i know that i want to get maybe like a mega scans grass texture or something like that 
And since like Mega Scans is actually built into Unreal 5 now, you could take full advantage of, um, you know, like AK textures and everything would just come in and all the PBR setup and nodes and everything are done for you. So I like doing that instead of Unreal sometimes instead of texturing stuff in cinema, but I like doing a combination of both because it's like I have a certain stylized style for all my objects here in which I have like this cartoony type look here in which I wouldn't have done inside of um, Unreal. And so, you know, it's a little, it's a little give and take depending on what you want to do. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to save this scene and let me actually, I'm going to delete my camera for right now because I'm going to show you guys my workflow for bringing stuff over to um, Unreal Engine. So I know this is a big question that I get when moving from like Cinema 4D to Unreal. A lot of people are ask me like, if I'm bringing in my entire scene and I have an animation of like a thousand frames or something like that, and then when you try to bring that into Unreal, each one of those frames have to be interpolated inside of Unreal when you're bringing it in. So sometimes it's gonna take a really long time depending on the specs of your machine and everything. And so the way that I like to work is if I have static images in my scene, I'm going to bring that in separately because there's no animation and then my animated objects i'm going to bring those in separately and then all the keyframe interpolation and all the math that has to do is going to be significantly smaller because it's not taking this scene and like interpolating it a thousand times if that makes any type of sense and so i'm going to take this scene that i have right here and bring this over into unreal uh, excuse me into unreal but i'm going to leave this as my build scene the cool thing about cinema 4d with these tabs up here and everything you can actually easily just right click and duplicate your whole entire project and that way i don't have to mess up like my build scene like i could just make a separate scene and then um i'm going to set this oh actually let me exit that out because i want to make sure that this scene is set up properly before i bring it over like i want to make sure that it's 1920 by 1080 and then I'm gonna do 24 frames per second. I like working at 60 frames per second, but my friend James Ramirez swears by 24, makes it look more cinematic. And so I'm doing this for you, James, if you're out there watching. I wanna make sure my scene is 24 frames per second here. But the caveat is this isn't the only place that we wanna make sure our frame rate is 24. We also wanna make sure like down here in the right hand side where it says project, you can see that it says time and FPS you want to make sure that these two different times correlate because even if you're rendering natively out of cinema 4d sometimes it will mess up like the frame or the animation interpolation and everything whenever you render it out so i know sometimes i've tried to align like footage that i've tracked render it out of um, cinema 4d to 3d part and recomposite it inside of after effects but it doesn't line up and that's because you might forget to change it down here where it says time fps so if you can't find like this little project mode here all you would do is hit Control d and that will bring up your attributes window and then you would make sure that you change this here as well so that's a really big tip whether you're rendering natively inside of cinema or you're bringing it into another application make sure that you're working with correlated frame rates in there and you should be good so from here i think I think that's going to be good from my setup. So yeah, 24 frames across the board. Hit Control S. Then I'm going to come up here, right click, duplicate project. And then I'm going to make sure I hit Control D again, because we have this little Cineware tab. And this Cineware is going to actually be vital for the information that we want to bring over to Unreal Engine. And so if you, say, if you click on the Cineware tag, you can see that we have a tag here that says Save Polygon Cache. So you definitely want to make sure you have that. I don't have any animations in here, which is going to save us a little bit of leeway when we bring it into Unreal. And then we do have materials, and so I do want to save a material cache. And I'm going to make these materials 4K because that's what I was working with initially. So 4096 by 4096. I'm going to do like a PNG format, and then I'm going to move over to 16-bit. Now I'm just going to hit Control S. Actually, no, I'm going to do Save As because this was the copied one. So no longer do we have to save project for Cineware. Whenever I was first introducing people from Cinema 4D to Unreal in the past, this is the way that you had to do it. But with the recent updates with Unreal 5 and Cinema 4D, all we have to do is basically save out a project file. So no longer do we have to have like astronomically large file sizes with Cineware. We just come over to save project as and just save out your project as you normally would. And so I'm gonna make this one SIGGRAPH22 underscore scene version two and i'm going to click on save on here and then let me open up 
Unreal Engine. Actually, this is my other scene. So I'm going to start this one completely from scratch. And so let me make a copy on my desktop real quick because I do have a scene that I previously set up with some materials and some plugins already turned on because I didn't want to bore you guys with that aspect of it. And so I'm going to actually open this one up and this is going to open up Unreal Engine 5. And so while this is getting set up, basically the reason that I pre-made this scene is because we have some plugins in here that every time you turn on a plugin in Unreal Engine, it's going to restart the entire project. And so like I wanted to make sure I had the C4D plugin turned on and then the new water node stuff in here also turned on as well. And so actually now that we're started up, I can show you exactly what I was talking about. So if I come over here to edit and come down here to plugins, I'm going to start with C4D. So just here in my search menu. I'm going to search for C4D and you can see that we have Data Smith C4D Importer, which is vital to have turned on. This is how we bring our Cinema 4D project into Unreal Engine 5. And then the other one that I have turned on is Water. And so this is brand new as well. If you look here, it says Water is still in beta. It's experimental, but it's really, really cool because it says like you can have a full suite of router tools. You can make like really large oceans. You can make interactive oceans, um, <laughs> rivers lakes you know custom bodies anything that you want to bring in here which is really really cool and so now that i have all my plugins already turned on the next thing i want to do is bring that scene in from cinema 4d that i was previously just building out so i'm going to start by deleting some of the stuff that's already in here by default so i'm going to delete the floor plan i'm going to delete this little controller here because we're not making a game we're doing a cinematic and then i'm probably going to delete like this reflection capture as well I'll leave everything else in here like whenever I'm in I'm here for two days so the second day I'm going to cover lighting and everything like that but for now I'm going to do just the basic lighting inside of Cinema 4 or inside of Unreal Engine and I'm going to bring in my Cinema 4D file now and so we have like this cube file up here with this little green plus symbol if I left click on this you can see that we have a data smith importer in which I'm just going to click on file import and then I'm going to look for that scene that I just saved out of Cinema 4D which is this one right here I'm going to click on open and that's going to bring up this window. I'm just going to leave it inside my contents folder. Nothing too fancy. Click OK. Then that's going to bring up our data smith import options in which I'm just going to leave everything on that was already turned on by default. Not going to switch anything out. Don't really need to. Then I'm going to give us a couple moments just to install everything into Unreal Engine here. Excuse me. I was taking a swig of water there. But you can see right now, it's actually starting to interpolate all those different frames and everything into Unreal. In which, if I would have did this for like 500 frames, it's going to have to do this calculation per each and every single frame. And that's why whenever I was inside of Cinema 4D and I was setting up my scene, I just have it for zero frames there. So whenever I go into Unreal, you can see that we have our scene in here and everything is built out and so everything is brought in exactly how we had it inside of cinema 4d all the materials and everything came over all the different transformations came over from our cloner like everything we did inside of cinema 4d 100 percent transformed over now i know the big question i also get is about third-party renders like a lot of people ask me like arnold octane redshift materials like that stuff isn't going to translate into Unreal Engine. Like you have to work with the standard Cinema 4D materials, at least for right now. And so if you look, like I just pretty much have like standard texture materials in here. Like procedural materials won't work either. But if you have like textured materials, those will work. So like PNGs, um, target files, things of that nature. And then like if you use like the color channel, the luminance channel, the normal channel, bump, you know, alpha. All this stuff will come over, but like any type of third-party render engines or anything, those won't come over, at least as of right now. But I feel like this is a pretty decent workflow if you want to get your stuff into Unreal. And so from here, I think, what do I want to add in next? I'm trying to see how much time I have here. Uh, we got a little bit more time. So I'm going to actually work on a camera move, but I'm going to do it in a different way. Like I'm not going to animate keyframes on my camera. I'm actually going to set up like hero camera shots and then let Cinema 4D interpolate all the different frames in between all my hero shots. And so I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. But let me first save this right here. Make sure I have my Cinema or my Unreal Engine file safe. Then I'm going to jump back over to Cinema. 
I'm going to go back into my build project here. And I'm actually going to make this, let's say, let's do like 400 frames. So we're doing 400 frames, 24 FPS across the board. And I'm going to start setting up my cameras in here. So I'm going to start with maybe this first camera. And I'm going to start just making like a bunch of cameras inside my scene. And the way I came up with this is I do a lot of work with like Discovery Channel and National Geographic and I'm building like these big CG roads and sometimes I have to um, show different landmarks within these CG roads and so I would always go to you know maybe like the showrunner show them a couple of different like camera um, compositions be like hey if I'm looking at the cabin is this composition one that you like and then take another camera show them a different part of the road and then once they sign off on the camera compositions then I just let Cinema 4D kind of work its magic from there. So you'll see exactly what I'm talking about if you're not familiar. So I'm just going to actually hold down the control key, left click, make a duplicate of my camera. I'm going to name this one camera two. I like naming these cameras like one, two, three, four, because it's easy to kind of just keep track when they're in like numerical order. So maybe let's say we started at the bottom of the bridge there and maybe we start pulling up. I'm going to maybe do it from like a POV looking straight. And we're starting to look maybe over towards our well area here like so and then i'm going to make another camera and so this is what i'm talking about like i'm just setting up like camera positions that i like so i'm going to make another one and let's say for like camera three we're going to be across the bridge but maybe we're starting to look a little bit forward so maybe oops hold on alt key move forward here somewhere like this so it's like camera two we started to look there camera one maybe let's start from like maybe a smaller let's do it from like a cat pov just finished playing stray on the playstation and pc so really loving the cat pov stuff right now so let's say we're at like a lower angle we move up as we cross the bridge maybe we come over here and then camera three maybe i can move it back a tad bit because maybe we still want to be looking at the well and then camera four is maybe where we start straightening it out. So do camera four. And I'm going to look through this camera. And then I'm just going to zero out my rotation. And maybe this is where we're starting to align more with our path here. So let's say, okay, we're looking at a path. I'm going to make a fifth camera here where we're going to actually move up our hero hillside here. So now I'm looking through camera five. I'm setting up my composition for this one as well and then let's say camera six we want to do like a pan zoom type thing so i'm going to make this one camera six look through to my camera here and then i'm going to come down here to where it says objects and right now like i was working at like the default camera length but this is something cool too that we can actually play around with maybe we do like on our last camera we want to do like a super wide shot and then we move it in and that gives us kind of like this cool like force perspective type move once we mo once we morph like all of our cameras together so i'm going to hit control s to save this one out and then i'm going to save this in numerical order which is really important you'll see why here in a second so i'm going to select my first camera hold down the shift key and then i'm just going to select my sixth camera so that's going to keep it in order from one to six and then i'm going to come over here to create and down here where we have our virtual set we have these different camera and or these different camera things that we can add in here in which i'm going to do the morph camera so camera morph right here and now you see like it brought up this different null and we have a camera in here that's called morph camera now the cool thing about this this actually added all six of those cameras that i have inside of my scene and it's going to basically do a camera move with no keyframes at all so if i look through my morph camera it's going to bring us back to camera one and then if i click on the tag here you can see that under our tag parameters we have something called blend and so i'm going to start at like the first keyframe here i'm going to start at the uh, first frame of my timeline here i'm going to left click add a keyframe and then i'm going to go to frame 400 and then i'm just going to drag this all the way up and now you can see it's actually going along the path of all these different cameras there which i think is really really dope so actually if i go back to the beginning and i just let this play out no keyframing at all it's basically making a path 
along that our camera is just going to kind of go through. So if you have a whole bunch of different cameras in your scene, if you do it in order, the way that I just showed you, it's actually going to, you know, um, animate our camera according to that path there. And if I actually bring it into my top viewport here, you can see, actually, let me hide these cameras here like so. So I'm going to left click, hold down the alt key, and that's going to hide them. But you can see these are actually named in the order of cameras that I had there. So we have camera one here, camera two, camera three. I don't know if you guys can see it, but it actually made like a spine path. And that's going to be the path that our camera trajectory is going to go along. So if I just scroll through my timeline here, you can see that the camera is actually moving along that path. So we literally did the whole camera move with only two keyframes. Everything is nice and smooth because if I go back to my projection here or my perspective view, you can see now everything is playing through. And if you didn't like the way that like this took off, like it has like an easy ease at the beginning, we do have like two other interpolations that we could use. Like by default, it says soft one, but we also have linear and then we have soft two as well. So I kind of like going between soft one and soft two, just kind of given or just depending on what it gives us. So I'm going to click on soft two I just kind of see like the trajectory that is going to give the velocity of the camera. Sometimes it just depends on like the distance of the cameras between each other, how smooth and how fast it's going to be moving. But typically I think soft one usually gives me like the best results. And then if you wanted something more hardline, like an old school amusement park, you know, like if you go to linear, there's going to be like no easy ease between any of these frames at all. It's just going to be all hard cuts. So as it's playing through, you can see like it just did a hard cut there, hard move, almost like those old school amusement park rides. And then, um, yeah, nothing smooth about it. So I think I'm going to stick with interpolation soft one for this example. And I'm going to hit control S and save it. And then again, I'm going to come up to my tab and I'm just going to duplicate this project because as I was saying before, I like bringing my animations in separately into Unreal Engine 5. So I already brought my static stuff in there. As you can see right there, that's all the static stuff that's not going to be moving. And so now I'm actually with my duplicated project. I'm just going to delete all the geometry out of my scene here. This is your 10 minutes warning. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So I have my, um, I have my cameras in here and that's all I'm going to leave in there. And I'm actually going to come down here to edit and I'm going to delete unused materials because I don't need to bring any materials in here as well. And actually, now we could do this one of two ways. And so I could bring this in as is, like I don't have to do nothing else in there, but like whenever we bring animation into Unreal, as I was saying before, it has to interpolate each and every one of those frames. And depending on the specs of your machine, if you have something that's not as powerful as some people, maybe you have like a mid-level computer, then basically it's going to take a long time to bring that in. So why not have Cinema 4D do the heavy lifting because this is all happening natively inside of Cinema 4D and it's going to go a lot more faster if we interpolate all the keyframes in here first. And so as I, as you saw at the top here, I went to like my animation tab because I'm going to come over here to my morph camera, left click, drag it down here into my dope sheet. And then I'm going to make sure I have my camera selected, come over here to functions, and then I'm just going to bake that entire trajectory into its individual keyframes. And so again, you don't have to do this if you have a more powerful computer, but I wanted to show you guys a way, like if you don't have a powerful computer, you can still bring your animations into Unreal Engine and still be able to work sufficiently on your system. So I'm going to click all parameters right here, and then I'm going to click OK. And then as you can see, like it did it instantly. Like you can see inside the viewport here, if I come out of camera mode, this is all the keyframes for the trajectory of that camera, all built inside of Cinema 4D, which happened instantly. Like, honestly, it's going to be a lot faster than it's going to happen inside of Unreal. And so from here, I'm just going to keep that camera and I'm going to name this one maybe like camera main, like so. And then I'm going to delete all these other cameras because I no longer need these anymore. I just need my main camera. And if I go through my timeline, you can see we still have our camera move and everything in there like so. So I'm going to go back to my standard view here. And again, I want to make sure that I save this out with the Cineware parameters. So I'm going to hit Control D on my keyboard. And that's going to bring up the shortcut for our project attributes down here. So if I bring this up, make sure you have Cineware selected. Again, I'm going to save Polygon Cache. 
I'm going to save animation cache and I don't have any materials that I'm going to bring over at this time. So those are the only two things that we need to check mark at this moment. And so now I'm basically just going to save out this project. I'm going to come down here to file, save project as remember, no longer have to save project for Cineware. I'm just going to save project as, and then I'm just going to name this one SIGGRAPH 22 camera, but I'm going to make this one version two, because this is the one that we're doing live here on the fly. And that's about it. And so now I'm going to come back over to Unreal Engine, bring up the scene that we had here before. Same way we did it before. I'm going to come right here where we have this cube with like this green plus symbol. Click on this, come down here to Datasmith, file import. And then I'm going to find that camera Cinema 4D project file that I previously made, which is this one here. I'm going to click on open. And I'm going to make it inside of its own folder, inside the content folder here. Click OK. And then for this one, the only thing I need to bring over is my camera and animation. So I can actually deselect these ones here. And then I'm going to hit import. And just like that, it all came right in. If I wouldn't have baked my keyframes first, that might have took like five to 10 minutes because I'm working on my laptop here. And so that is an easy way that you could kind of bake your keyframes in, bring them into Unreal Engine and have some of my 4D do out of heavy lifting. So now once I'm inside my content browser, I have this little folder here called animation and this is going to be the animations brought over from cinema 4d and so we have this little clipboard here it's your timeline it's called the sequencer inside of unreal engine but if i double click it you can see now we have our timeline and it has all the attributes already set up that we have set up inside of cinema 4d so my frame rate 24 frames per second as we have set up if i actually look through my camera this is going to be hd so 1920 by 1080 and if i click play you can see now we have our camera move and everything running inside of Unreal Engine. And so that was a quick and easy way that we were able to bring all of our different parameters inside of Unreal Engine and bring it into our scene here. And so I'm actually going to click save just to make sure I have everything saved here. And again, like I alluded to at the beginning of the show, I'm actually here for two days. And so I broke this up into two parts like today. I wanted to show you guys how we could build up this basic scene here inside of Unreal Engine and Cinema 4D. And tomorrow, let me actually, I'm gonna close this part out so I can show you the other scene that I have built here. So open this one up in here. But tomorrow, I'm gonna to show you more stuff. Like we're gonna go back into Cinema 4D. We're gonna create like a huge terrain. Like today, or today we just built like the hero area that we kind of wanna focus on, but we're gonna need like background landscapes. We're gonna need foliage. We're going to need all types of crazy stuff in here. So by the end of tomorrow's show, this is basically what we're going to build here in which we've been building here from scratch at the show. So if I just play through same basic type of camera moves and everything, but you can see like I have painted vertex painting for the ground. I have the grass in here. I have the moving trees. If I pull out of my camera, you can see we have real time water working underneath our bridge and everything here. So I'm going to show you guys how we could do all this stuff tomorrow. But for today, I think we're in a good spot. So anybody have any questions? I'm oh, sorry. I can't hear what he said. Yeah, we got a question here. Shout it out. It didn't. Let me. Um, let me double check. Mm. So the question was the camera angle didn't change. You talking about the how we did like the rock focus pull thing at the end? Let me check. I didn't notice that. Let me see. Cause yeah, once you bake all the frames, like all that stuff should come in there. So let me see. But while this is opening up, do we got any more questions here? I did have a couple of comments from earlier on when you uh, were building I mean, all the rocks and everything. Um, and it was about the building, building well, we in from the. Do that. So I must have not baked that frame, but we'll go. Th we'll get that tomorrow. So you're back tomorrow, yeah? Yeah, it's definitely possible there. For some reason, it didn't bake those frames, but yeah, 100%, you could do it. Ah, uh, no worries. One of the questions was um, loving your kit bash technique, but yes. also, do you ever use the place tool for taking stuff? Like if you're using the asset browser and placing stuff in rather than um, organizing it around? Um, it's a combination between both, just depending on how I'm vibing that day. You know, if I have some 
some Red Bull before my session and I'm feeling like kind of crazy, you know, anything can happen. So. See, that's, yeah, the, that's so. the beauty. There's so <laughs> many different ways to do lots of different things. Absolutely. I mean, if we want to get into, I mean, this is something that if we have extra time tomorrow, I wanted to show, but since you brought up the asset or the, um, the asset browser, we do have a motion capture library that not a lot of people know about. So like I was going to bring in a character that I already had pre-rigged, show you guys how we could take like a T-Pose character, use some of the animations inside the asset library, bring that into Unreal, and you have animated characters and everything as well. So I'm glad you mentioned that because that's one yes. of the cool things about yeah. <laughs> all the cool uses of having an asset browser to populate stuff really quickly. Yes. So that's fantastic. And the, the other thing was some great um, access tips there, a great way of working to zero everything out. Yes. And um, also the access center. So people were loving that too. Awesome. As, and also we had several what up, what ups on the chat at yeah. the beginning. Of what course. Up, what up? <laughs> But I'm really interested for part two that you're going to do tomorrow because yes. there's so many questions we get about what is the best practice for bringing stuff over to Unreal and stuff we were talking about before mm -hmm. about the, the animations and also the lighting and the, the scenes. So that's something that you'll be covering tomorrow, isn't it? Yes. And if there's anything specific, like I do this on the fly. Like I told you, I do this in my sleep. So anybody wants to throw anything at me, if they have any questions that they want me to cover tomorrow, throw it my way. Fantastic. And we did have one very popular question was, could you bring up that link that you mentioned at the beginning for the competition? Yes, I think I do have internet here. So let me go to my YouTube. I'm actually going to turn off the sound because I know it's going to get kind of crazy here. What we up, want what to up? make sure we have the right link. Okay, so I didn't turn off the audio. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so if you go to either my YouTube channel or EJ, so youtube.com slash Jonathan Wimbush, we have this announcement trailer, which is actually going to play a commercial, but it has all the details in here and everything. So just go to my YouTube channel, look for Unreal Engine Challenge with prizes, Pug for his challenge, hashtag, um, all the different parameters that you need is in here. Um, everything is due September 1st, but as I alluded to, we have Maxon as one of the sponsors for the contest. And so we have the full sweep, Cinema 4D, ZBrush, um, Universe, Forger, Red Giant, all types of good stuff in there. 3090, courtesy of Puget Systems, and a holographic tablet. So we do have a template in here. And um, if you go to the video, we go through everything, but you do need to use the template because we do have like a, a setup that we did set up inside of Cinema 4D first that we brought over to Unreal. So we just ask that you build around those parameters and yeah, can't wait to see everybody's entries. Fantastic. And I'm sure the team um, back at home are going to put that link into the chat as well. So thank you in yes. advance for getting that. And thanks for showing us it again. So brilliant. Once again, the fantastic tips. And yeah, um, you. you're just a, a, such an amazing educator, Wimbush. I ah, appreciate just, you, just man. It's fantastic yeah. to have you here. My new BFF right so, here, Sam. Thank you so much. <laughs> And uh, stay, stay around because we've got Ross Gaultier who's going to be um, following up from his presentation yesterday about all sorts of amazing things you can do with AOVs and compositing and the link between cinema and After Effects. So stay for that. That'll be up in a couple of minutes.